Good evening or afternoon or morning, depending on where in the world you are at the moment. And welcome to the closing event of this year's Classical Wisdom Symposium, a panel discussion entitled, What Control Do We Have Over the End of Empires? And How Can We Prepare for Their Inevitable Fall? Uh, obviously, we can approach the topic of today's discussion in any number of ways and look at it from lots of different angles. So who are the we in these two questions? Individuals, families, communities, or the entire human race? And what is the end of an empire? Is it about land and wealth, bricks and mortar, or something more personal, uh, subjective truth? And what do we mean by preparation? Are we talking physically, financially, emotionally, religiously, philosophically? And if these seem like difficult questions to answer, then we're very fortunate indeed to have three of the 21st century's most prominent philosophers here to help us answer them. We have William B. Irvin, is Professor of Philosophy at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. He's the author of eight books, including A Guide to the Good Life, the Ancient Art of Stoic Joy, and more recently, The Stoic Challenge, A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, Calmer, and More Resilient. He's currently working on a book about thinking critically, but with an open mind in the age of the internet. Anthony Arthur Long is an Anglo-American classical scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. I would give his full list of academic titles. However, this panel discussion is only 45 minutes long and I probably can't manage that. He's the author of many books, including Greek Models of Mind and Self, How to Be Free, An Ancient Guide to the Stoic Life, and most recently, Seneca, 50 Letters of a Roman Stoic. And from this afternoon, we welcome back Donald Robertson, Donald is a writer, trainer, psychotherapist, and an expert on the relationship between modern cognitive behavioral therapy and classical Greek and Roman philosophy. He's also the founder of Modern Stoicism and the author of How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Okay, so that's enough from me for the moment. So I would say I'd like to ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and maybe talk about how and why they got interested in Stoicism and discuss what is their current field or fields of interest. So, um, William B. Irvin, if you'd like to start us off, please. Oh, sure. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I came to Stoicism in a very roundabout ma manner. I was introduced to the Stoics in college but not in a proper philosophy class. It was in a, a logic class because it turns out that the Stoics were some of the preeminent, were the preeminent uh, logicians of their time. And they uh, came up with propositional logic, um, the fundamentals of propositional logic. And that's what makes computers work. So they, they actually play an interesting role. And most people, if you, if you talk about uh, Stoics, they just think that, that these are these glum people who just sit around and, and take life's uh, blows early as they can, but that's not uh, simply not true. Um, I did briefly touch on them in uh, the regular philosophy classes I took, but uh, I very quickly got the impression that, uh, and this would have been in the 1970s, that my professors weren't really interested in advice on how to live a good life, uh, that, that that was something I should not be worried about. Uh, so I didn't, and uh, I, I left with their logic, but very little of their uh, philosophy or their advice on living. And it was only in the early 2000s I was working uh, on a book on human uh, desire, titled On Desire. And uh, I uh, once again encountered, I was talking about different uh, ancient advice that had been given on how to live. Um, so I once again bumped into the Stoics and this time uh, looked at their advice and compared it to advice given by other uh, ancient philosophers and by people uh, like the Buddha and uh, came away thinking, 
well, this is really great stuff. Why did they never show me this in college? Uh, and uh, came out of that uh, a practicing quick in the sense that they had a number of psychological strategies. And uh, I put those to work in my life and found that they were quite useful in, in helping me avoid uh, negative emotions like anger and envy and frustration, but uh, enjoy positive emotions like feelings of delight uh, and even uh, feelings of joy and a sense of awe to be uh, alive in this universe. Um, so out of that came the book, um, um, uh, The Guide to the Good Life, uh, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. Uh, my, my timing was impeccable. It turned out I got in on, on uh, the wave that was later uh, to build, and that was the rise uh, or, or the resurrection of Stoicism in the 21st century. And now it's uh, very uh, popular, many, many books uh, written on it. Um, subsequently wrote two more books, uh, one on uh, Stoic take on insults called A Slap in the Face, and then most recently, a book on dealing with life's uh, everyday setbacks, and that's called uh, The Stoic Challenge. Um, so I'm kind of stoic out as far as that goes, and I've, my, my research has taken a, a kind of an interesting turn, and it ties in with the theme of this panel, and that is the fall of, of civilizations. So um, gone full circle, and now I'm back to uh, back to logic. And so the interesting question for me is uh, how can we, so, so every day we grapple, we have this, this rational mind, call it your head, that gets to fight with your heart and gut uh, every day. And uh, the heart and gut sometimes have the right answer, oftentimes have the very uh, wrong answer. Uh, so then the question is, um, how, do you, how, how do you manage that? If you actually want to live a, a rational life, but you're a mere human being and you have these more primitive uh, uh, sources of energy within you, how do you best cope with them? And uh, so you think critically, but thinking critically is going to shrink the number of beliefs you have. And so you simultaneously need to be selectively opening your mind to uh, new ideas. And that way you well, can- Well, that's uh, uh, so one, wonderful, wonderful overview to begin with. And I'm sure we'll get, okay. into, get into the weeds of all this very shortly. Um, Professor Long, could you um, just come, come to tell us uh, how you came to be where you are? Uh, stoically? Uh, ben and, and Anya, if she's listening, uh, thank you very much again for involving me and uh, with Donald once before and now Bill Irvine. Very nice to, to meet you for the first time, I think, online. Yes. So my story goes back a very long time because I'm very old. And um, when I graduated in 1960 uh, in England, uh, Stoicism was a total dead duck. I mean, nobody thought of it as a philosophy at all. Uh, Plato and Aristotle were all the rage, um, and um, Epicureanism was a bit some interest and scepticism a bit, but Stoicism, ha, you know, we, we're British, we don't need Stoicism. <laughs> so, um, so, but my teacher, a wonderful scholar called David Furley, uh, who taught me Greek and uh, taught me the um, also interested in the Stoics and, and in the Epicureans. And when I asked him what he thought was the best subject for me to take on as a, a, a for research, he said the Stoics are the most neglected field. And he was quite right about that. So he wanted me to work on uh, uh, the Greek author, Plutarch. Plutarch wrote a number of essays critical of the Stoics, but a very important source for the ancient ideas, the, the, the theory of the ancient Stoics. But I thought I, I, I didn't know enough ancient Greek at that stage to do that. So I, I, I dodged, the, dodged it and then and wrote a book on something else, but, uh, and a PhD on something else. But then, then I came back in about 1964 and um, started reading the Stoics very seriously and trying to really master the ancient sources and gave some talks and organized conferences and sat and in, in the academic world in England, in, in philosophy anyway, and classics, uh, the subject began to take off, but didn't have any, any popular thing at that time. Um, but, but I continued my work on, on the Stoic theory, and I, I actually had made some rather rude remarks in one book about the, the Romans, rather, rather sort of saying, well, 
they, they were just, you know, they were practitioners of, uh, of therapy, but they weren't, um, you know, they weren't theoretical philosophers of any importance. Well, I saw the error of my ways in, in due course. And when about 20 years ago, as Bill has said, stoicism began to be, you know, really taken up as a, as a sort of modern way of life, I, I, I thought better of this. So I wrote two books on Epictetus and, uh, and now the, the new, new book coming out on Seneca. And, and so uh, and those books seem to have done, you know, got done well. And uh, they, they do seem to have touched a nerve. Um, and uh, you, I mean, both uh, Donald, of course, is, is a practitioner and psychotherapist and, and, and has made very strong use of it. But I'm finding it's um, very, very interesting indeed to, to talk to people about stoicism and what it, what, can, what it can do for us. So I think, you know, coming to, not to take a lot too long, um, well, we obviously be talking about empire and we'll have, as, as Ben said, you know, have to try to define it. Um, just let, let me just say for the beginning, I think that oh, the Stoics, <coughs> the Roman Stoics, <coughs> are the, the people we read most, Seneca, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, um, were all, of course, living through an empire. One of them was an emperor. Um, I don't think any of actually saw, saw the, the eventual end of the Roman Empire, which took a very long time, in fact, to fail. According to Gibbon, it didn't fail until the, the middle of the, the 15th century. So it was about 2,000 years almost. Um, but um, uh, uh, I think the, the, what I would like to talk very much about, I mean, if you think of the United States as a kind of empire, that's controversial, but at least you know, a, very, a very wide reaching power with, with enormous um, social problems today, I think, which I'd like to talk about. I think stoicism is, is an enormous importance and interest to people and can help them a great deal, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in due course. So, so well, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Excellent. Well, you definitely have touched a nerve. We've already got a, um, a comment in, in the chat saying Epictetus, yay. So I think um, there's obviously a, a wave to be crested. And uh, finally, Donald Robertson, uh, if you briefly uh, introduce yourself. Thanks, Ben. And thanks to you and Anya again, uh, first of all. And also it's a pleasure to be on with Tony Long and, and Bill Irvine uh, once again. Um, my background, originally I studied philosophy and then I studied at Sheffield University in an interdisciplinary department, looking at the relationship between philosophy and psychotherapy. And I thought, wow, the best way to combine philosophy and psychotherapy would be to take psychoanalytic therapy and combine it with existential philosophy. So I tried doing that for about six months and then I realized it just wasn't working out for me. So I did a complete U-turn or pivot or whatever. And uh, I went around looking for a diff completely different type of therapy and a completely different type of philosophy. And through reading the works of Pierre Hadot, actually about Plotinus, I was read eventually to read the rest of his books about Hellenistic philosophy in particular. And I quickly figured out that Hadot was talking about these spiritual exercises that he detected in the classics. But actually, they seem to me very similar to psychological exercises that we use in therapy. And then most of them, predominantly, that he's quoting were in the Stoic uh, authors. So I, I started looking at the relationship between Stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy, because cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, inspired by Stoic philosophy, very explicitly so. And about 12 years ago now or something, I, I wrote a book um, about called The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, about the relationship between these two things. And that led to me being invited roughly a decade ago, 12 years ago or something, by Professor Chris Gill, um, Professor Emeritus of Ancient Thought at Exeter University, along with a bunch of other people. And we collectively founded the Modern Stoicism Organization, which runs annual conferences and online courses. And then Stoicism became what the young people today call a thing. So at some point, Stoicism became a thing. And like uh, Tony Long and Bill Irvine, I was kind of, uh, you know, wrong-footed, but I was uh, nonplussed by the sudden popularity of what I had originally been told was a really nerdy, obscure kind of niche philosophy. So I guess we all, all three of us landed on our feet. Yeah. Yes. We became trendy. Yes, yes. Uh, everybody's ambition is to become a thing. That's, yes, yeah. Okay, so well, 
I mean, people are here to listen to to you gentlemen much more than me. So I'll just kick us off with with the two questions that are in the, the title of, of this panel. And um, if you hopefully you, you bounce the ideas around together and maybe I'll just sort of step in if somebody's having a problem with their the internet and we can't hear them, I might ask them to stop and we will come back to them a bit later. Or maybe if somebody else needs to um, to, to jump into to the conversation, I'm, but I'll I'll mostly stay out of this. So if we can see where we can go with these two questions, what control do we have over the end of empires? And leading on from that, how can we prepare for their inevitable fall? So um, let's see. Uh, uh, Professor Long, do you want to get us kicked off on this? Uh, thank you very much, Ben. And I'll try to be brief. We want to get you know, a lot of interaction if possible. Um, I don't think that um, ancient Stoicism ever addressed exactly the end of empire. I mean, Marcus Aurelius himself was an emperor. In fact, Gibbon called the period that um, Marcus Aurelius was living through the most felicitous perhaps in human history. Well, that was an 18th century point of view. But the point is, I think that from the time of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism to Marcus Aurelius, period of about 500 years, a life in, in, in political sense was fairly secure for a lot of people. The, the, the Romans had conquered Greece, but they ran their empire rather efficiently with a great deal more presence, I think, than uh, a lot of subsequent uh, leaders of empire have. And so for a lot of people, I think life was quite secure uh, in, the, in that empire. As, as to what we can do about it, I don't think we can do anything directly about uh, if, we, if we did anticipate the fall of empire, but I think if we think of empire in a more generic way, as you were suggesting we should, Ben, there are so many issues, uh, huge issues, of, of just to mention one or two, our political and social polarization, the stupidity and irrationality of anti-vaccine propaganda, ludicrous conspiracy theories, social isolation, little or no concern for the common good, and I could rattle on. And on all those issues, I think Stoicism has an enormous amount to offer particularly for the following reasons. Um, one of the, the things you've both written about, I'm sure, is what the, Ro the Romans called prior meditatio malorum, anticipating trouble and catastrophic change of fortune, and, and, how, to, and, and how to so anticipate it in the sense that you should be mentally prepared for every, everything that's quick, all the possible contingencies. I mean, not to, to be worrying about it all day long, but recognizing that death is inevitable, sickness is inevitable, change is inevitable. And change is, two, is, a two thing, is, is something that both Marcus Aurelius and, uh, and Seneca dwell on all the time. Uh, uh, I mean, so I don't, don't need to give you quotes about that, but I think ment mentally prepared, recognizing that others have suffered similarly to anything you will suffer from, probably let, much more so, um, that uh, the only unconditional things in your power are to try to be a good person and avoid being a bad person. I mean, putting it very simply, and everything that outside of you, you, you never have complete control over because it depends on contingencies and causes outside your own doing. Of course, it doesn't mean you can't uh, I have to do all kinds of things and people who've got great power often do very bad things with it. But the, but the actual sense in which we're directly responsible for the external world is, is, is much more limited than what we think we can do for ourselves. So, I, I, so that's, I think, um, applies, to, it applies to empire in the, in, the, in the traditional sense, and it applies to it in a much more extended sense. But let me just pause there and let somebody else come in. Professor Evan? Um. So the question of can we control what's going to happen? And, and you know, there are lots of ways a civilization uh, can end. And, and Tony was focusing on some of the human factors. And of course, Stoicism does have a very wonderful way to prepare ourselves for that and a, and a wonderful way to deal with it. But uh, civilizations can end for a number of reasons and some of them are external. Uh, and in, um, in his book, Precipice, uh, uh, Toby Ord describes a bunch of the different ways life as we know it can, can end. Uh, you know, there's a meteor strike uh, which uh, took out the dinosaurs. This is an external thing. 
uh, we would probably know it was coming and then it would come and then uh, that would be the end. And if we knew far enough ahead, maybe, maybe we could affect it, but otherwise it's beyond our control. Uh, climate change, it's an interesting thing. You can see it coming. And yet, you know, there's that frustrating feeling of knowing that there's this very great danger and knowing that so much of humanity is just ignoring it or, or, or just looking down the road and thinking it's going to catch up to us uh, sometime. It's a slow thing. And, you know, uh, of we, we only have one success story coming out of um, the whole climate change thing, and that was with... Uh, reducing the emissions of Freon, right, which was destroying the, the ozone uh, uh, hole. We have one success. We have numerous failures, dragging of feet, just thinking, you know, it's not a problem or it'll become a problem in the future. Right now, because of the pandemic, we get a, a really good feeling of what one of these human caused disasters is, is going to be like. Just the deep sense of frustration that we have the answer, right? What do we need to do? We need to get vaccinated. And if people would just get vaccinated, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but it would certainly make the problem uh, a lot less. And of course, it isn't just people in advanced, uh, in, in um, affluent countries getting vaccinated. You need it around the world. And, uh, and yet, uh, you know, the human factor has kicked in. Uh, a significant number of people refusing it and saying, well, I don't think it's a serious problem or I don't think that's the solution to the problem. And there's one way things could go in, uh, in one of these uh, uh, civilization ending human caused disasters that it, you know, it could be something along those lines where uh, the people who are, th who are thoughtful people thinking about things realize, oh, we have it in our grasp to stop this, and yet we can't bring ourselves to do it. And, and uh, uh, again, lots of different ways for civilization to end. Um, it's um, paper-thin veneer is all it is. It can be gone in a matter of days, and it can also be a long, slow decline. But just uh, if, if I'm there, if I'm around for that, I... I uh, hope I live for a long time, but I hope I'm not around for that. Just that frustrating feeling of why can't we stop this? Uh, mm. But I'm sure in the past, there were, uh, you know, the past declines of civilizations. People had that same feeling. And if Donald Robertson, you'd like to come in. I was also wondering there, does it make any difference if these factors are external, like a meteorite or maybe more self-inflicted? Does, do, does our reaction and what we can do and, and how we can feel about those, those different um, fatalities, those different um, terrible um, events, does it change, change how we react or change our emotional state in any way? Mm. I'd like to say a little bit about that, but before I do, I can never resist the temptation on these panels to talk about the area that I'm least qualified to comment on. Uh, which is ancient history, I suppose. And it, I'll put it out there just for the sake of discussion that I, I was thinking just now that in a sense, one student of Stoicism actually did preside over the fall of an empire uh, and another student of Stoicism presided over the destruction of a, an empire. And uh, the first one, um, historically, would be uh, Scipio the Younger, who was allegedly a student of Panetius, the Stoic, and presided over the destruction of Carthage. And the other one I'm thinking of, actually, if you'll bear with me on this for a sec, is Augustus, who allegedly had two Stoic tutors, and towards the end of his life, wrote a lot about philosophy and allegedly wrote a book on Stoicism, which is lost to us now, called The Exhortations of Philosophy. And Augustus arguably presided over um, he did obviously preside over the founding of the, the Roman Empire, but the Roman Republic was an empire of sorts, ironically. And uh, Augustus, in a sense, presided uh, over its transformation into what we call the, the Roman Empire. So in a sense, the, the fall of a regime. Um, so anyway, that, there, there's a whole can of worms historically. But I wanted to hit you with a quote as well, which I think relates to what you were saying. Seneca said, the greatest empire 
is to be emperor of oneself. So I think we have to cite that quote from Seneca, given the topic that we've got. Yep. The, the, yeah, that's a good one. The, um, the opening sentence, a good place to start is at the beginning. So the first sentence of the Enchiridion, or the Handbook of Epictetus, is famously, uh, some things are up to us and other things are not. And it's at the beginning, because in a sense, it's foundational to the rest of what follows. <laughs> And we can apply to that to this idea of the fall of nations or the fall of empires. I think the Stoics would say that we don't have direct control or absolute control over anything really except our own volition or our own voluntary thoughts and actions. But we can, of course, exert control indirectly over other things in the world through our voluntary words and actions. But the point that I think the Stoics are making is that we never know for certain how much indirect control we have over external events. And it varies wildly depending on our circumstances. Um, so I might have quite a lot of control over whether I can pick a pencil up or not, unless I have a stroke or something like that. But I've probably got limited control over big uh, global issues like uh, an election or, or climate change or a pandemic and things like that. Nevertheless, there might be ways that people's actions and words individually could have an impact on these things. So I think that the Stoics would say that we need to be careful to have a philosophical attitude to these situations. Um, and that means really keeping a close eye on the distinction between what's directly under our control and what's only indirectly under our control. And where there's inevitably an element of uncertainty. And it's the same in cognitive therapy, actually. Tolerance of uncertainty is uh, uh, an important trait that's researched in modern psychotherapy. It seems to be quite closely related to many of the ideas in Stoicism. And I think fundamentally, sometimes people think the Stoics are kind of passive and the history of the Stoic movement really completely uh, contradicts that. The, the Stoics often, give their lives uh, defying dictatorship. So it's what we call the Stoic opposition, for example. And I think fundamentally what the Stoics were really trying to do is to square a circle, to figure out how one can be emotionally accepting or unperturbed uh, by adversity and uncertainty in life, while nevertheless remaining committed to determined and courageous and self-disciplined action in the service of wisdom. And justice. And most people, you know, either get really engaged with the world and drive themselves crazy, or they become really detached and kind of nihilistic. And so the Stoics want us to find this way to strike a balance whereby we can remain engaged with external events and even big global political issues like global warming, the pa pandemic, the end of empires and so on, but nevertheless do so with a philosophical attitude uh, and a, a certain uh, amount of emotional resignation or detachment. Should I come, kind of come in now with please, like please. To cap, um, Donald with another uh, a Seneca quotation? He's talking about Alexander the Great, and he says, "The conqueror of so many kings and peoples was felled by anger and gloom. He endeavoured to control everything except his passions. How terrible these people go astray, who long extend their imperial authority beyond the seas." and deem themselves supremely fortunate if they hold many provinces with their armies, ignorant of self-mastery, the greatest command of all. And, and I think it does a, a word about both the historical figures, Marcus and, and Seneca. Marcus, of course, was a very um, meditative and, and I think sort of quiet man by his temperament, but compelled by his duties as emperor to engage in defensive wars against uh, the, the, the tribes that were threatening the provinces. And he also, of course, had to live through a, a terrible pandemic, just like we are. And, and apparently, you know, he, he, he even made the imperial palace and his own personal property available to people who were suffering. And in the case of Seneca, he had to, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I shouldn't say this perhaps, but he had to manage a a somewhat Donald Trump-like character, namely Emperor Nero, uh, and then was forced, of course, uh, by Nero to sort of try to, to stay in power. He, he withdrew, 
but he also experienced, um, you know, many, many other you know, sort of normal calamities of life, which he writes about in, with great uh, movement, you know, moving way, a, a loss of friends and so forth. And a wonderful letter, which far too long for me to, to, to quote, about a terrible fire that destroyed the city of Lyon, a great city in the, in the province of Gaul, in a few moments. And I recommend everybody just to read his his empathy for, for the people of Gaul at that time, uh, again, totally belies the idea of the grim, the grim Stoic. Um, and just while I have the, the screen for a moment, I'd just like to say a thought, I mean, which I'd very much be interested in my co-panelists' uh, views on, uh, talking about the, the, the success, the success of uh, modern, the modern Stoic movement. And I think it's, it's also, it's not entirely, uh, to the credit of the Stoics, I think genetically we are programmed to deal with disaster. We couldn't have survived as a species if we, were, if we hadn't got that. So in a sense, Stoicism is, is rationalizing and, and theorizing about something which is, is actually built into our nature. And perhaps the best thing we can do, I think, as, uh, as propagandists for modern Stoicism, is to try to convince people that they have far more resources for dealing with difficulty, you know, whatever it may be. It could be a marital difficulty, it could be a, a job, it could be illness. We have far more internal resources than we're, our culture, I think, has acculturated people to look outside for help uh, and assume there is a, a kind of gut somebody out there, there's a prescription you can take or somebody you can talk to. Whereas in fact, the best resources, the Stoics would say, are our own, our, own, uh, our own capacities, but we need to be opened up to them. And I think that's, that's, some, that's something that all three Roman, great Roman Stoics insist on all the time. We have the resources, have to know how to use them. Yeah, I'd like to jump in at, at that. Um, so in the book On Desire, I explored the evolutionary kind of programming that made us who we are. And the snag is we are programmed, wonderfully programmed to survive and reproduce on the savannas of Africa 200,000 years ago. And we're no longer in that environment. And yet we, we, can, we have the mental apparatus that would suit us for that environment. So that's a dangerous combination. Um, so in my latest research, I'm thinking about the power of one story, you know, you can try to convince somebody of something with a long, very thought out, uh, you know, logical argument with lots of statistics and it's powerless against one story. So when it comes to risk, people fixate on some danger. So I know people, for instance, who refuse to wear seatbelts when they're in their car. How come? Because uh, they heard about a case where somebody was wearing their seatbelt and the car crashed and caught fire and the seatbelt jammed and they couldn't get out. And that is enough to, to wipe out the power of you know, the higher brain function. Yeah, but check out the statistics. Think about, think about all of the things, the other ways, the crashes that you don't see. I also know people who will drive instead of flying, even though flying is however you measure it a hundred times safer. So that's part of the problem when it comes to um, things that can end civilizations is there's that risk element and yet we aren't used to thinking in terms of a global risk uh, what what's risk well it's when the tribe down the down the savannah comes charging up and and kills us and 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 uh, and does whatever um, and we're just not prepared for that now there are steps we can take to to try to remedy that and maybe we can get into that later in the talk but that's one of the snags with our, our programming. Well, this is, yeah, this is, I mean, this is all very um, strange enough. There's a bit of a side conversation going on. I've actually been monitoring um, the chat. I don't know if anybody's popped into it, but there's there's been a little bit of a, while we're having our conversation, there's been a bit of a conversation going on at the side there as well, which really speaks to what um, um, you guys have been talking about. So I was wondering, with, with, with this in mind, I was interested in um, 
in this question, perhaps it ties in with what uh, Professor Irvin is studying at the moment. I was thinking in a world where it's conceivable that uh, a Twitter war might become a hot war overnight, do we need to have some sort of new conventions when it comes to internet use? Do we have to think about what is wiki stoicism? Is it, is it different to, to how we've traditionally been able to, to, to respond to these things in the past in more, in more traditional interactions with people? Uh, I'll jump in if no one else is, uh, is jumping in. Uh, so the internet is a powerful phenomenon. Uh, you know, we have these cognitive biases. One of them is confirmation bias and the internet, uh, social media in particular, are a confirmation bias engine. And what they do is they take certain tendencies that we have and they magnify them. And simultaneously, things like Twitter uh, force us to compress complex thoughts into a handful of characters. And most things we're thinking about are too complex to do that. And um, so that's the, the downside. You, you, take, you take these cognitive biases, you introduce uh, the internet in particular social media, and it magnifies them. Um, so that, that's bad news if what you're trying to do is preserve a civilization in the, in the long run, because people who are out to bring it down can easily find each other on the internet and can act on whatever conclusions they draw. I'll just respond to that as well a lot, but if I, if I may, um, I, I've written a lot about this in, in medium articles and things like that. It is a subject that people are very interested in, so I'm sure that uh, Bill Irvine's book's going to do really well because there's a, I know there's a lot of demand among people that are interested in stoicism to find out how it could apply to the internet in this world that we now find ourselves in. When I was studying the classics, uh, I used to think the sophists and uh, the way that Socrates interacted with them and other philosophers talk about them was kind of quaint. And uh, I thought we don't really have sophists as such today. We've got things that we can kind of compare to it. And I suppose some self-help gurus and um, some political gurus might be compared to the, the sophists today, but it didn't seem like quite the same thing. And then one day it kind of suddenly hit me when I was on Facebook or whatever, that in a sense, Facebook is a big sophist and Twitter and uh, these social media platforms function like sophists in a way. The sophists, um, at least some of them, would literally compete against one another to get the biggest round of applause that they could from the audience. So they would say whatever they could to get a reaction from an audience. And that was one of Socrates' main concerns with them. They were driven by persuasion and reactions and emotions of the audience rather than by the pursuit of truth itself. And that's exactly how social media works. Uh, you know, the posts that get the most engagement will often be the most inflammatory and simplistic ones. And so social media rewards um, simplistic, highly emotive, yes. uh, often distorted forms of communication, um, gets the biggest uh, uh, reaction from the audience. And that's pretty much the problem with this office uh, to a large extent. And so I think there are many parallels between the problems that the philosophers in ancient Greece and Rome tried to address and the ones that we face today. And I completely agree with everything that Bill's just said about these cognitive biases. And I guess a, a very closely related one that I'd mention is that one of the benefits of social media, so particularly, let's pick on Twitter. Um, one of the benefits of Twitter is that it allows communication in a way to, to be faster and more efficient because it's more kind of stripped down but we obviously lose social cues. We don't see someone's facial expression when they're talking to us. We don't understand a person's character right. or their personal history yeah. when we're speaking to it. It's abstracted from all of the information that would normally be available to us. And I guess naively we might think, well, we don't need to know who we're talking to. You know, we don't need to be able to see their face and hear the tone in their voice. We just want the words. Like, we give us the data, give us the information. But the problem with that is that, um, first of all, being aware of 
someone in a more rounded way tends to moderate our extreme emotional responses. Because a, a really simple way of looking at this uh, is just in terms of kind of behavioral conditioning. We, if we're only faced with one stimulus, we'll respond to that stimulus. It's like we're putting it under a magnifying glass. But if I know who, what Bill is like, I've seen him in other contexts, I've heard him talking about other things, and he says something that I happen not to agree with, I'll interpret that and respond to it within that broader context of information that I have about him. And it will change the way I interpret that stuff, but it also changes the emotional reaction I have because I'm hearing the individual comment he's making on Twitter or reading it, but also before my mind, I have this array of other stimuli that evoke other emotional responses. So my reaction kind of gets diluted, if you like, or I end up with a more nuanced, more complex, uh, multicolored tapestry yeah. of uh, emotions. And you don't get that on social media. What you get is one little nugget of information and if it happens to hit a nerve with you, then it's like you've just put it under a magnifying glass and you're going to respond to that and only that. And it's a recipe for neurosis, basically. It's a, a recipe for pathological anger um, and for a lack of empathy and uh, for extreme uh, emotional reactions. And I think that's what we tend to see happening on the internet. Um, arguments escalate very rapidly. People... Um, gravitate towards extreme positions. And the Stoics want us to try and take a step back from all of this and to view other people generally in a more rounded and complete way. Generally, uh, one of the major themes in Stoicism is looking at the bigger picture in many different ways and different levels. But the Stoics want us to take a step back and respond to things within a broader context. And social media really does the polar opposite of that. It narrows our focus of attention and uh, distorts it in doing so. Let me jump in and then uh, Tony can jump in. Uh, quick comments. I I'm sorry, Tony, but I'm an old man and I forget it unless I say it quickly. You're still a young fellow, so that's uh, not going to happen. One is anonymity is possible on the internet and anonymity brings out the worst in absolutely everyone. If you say, think you can say something and people can't track back the source. The other thing is one of the things that you can control with respect to the internet is your exposure to it, how you're exposed to it. You can go out of your way. Once you really believe something, look on the internet and find the most intelligent, articulate person you can who takes the opposite side of that debate and hear them out. And if you're saying, well, there is nobody who's on the other side who's articulate and intelligent, they're all idiots. Whoa, you're in the grip of confirmation bias. So that's something you can do. Uh, you know, monitor what goes into your mind. Be open-minded, be open to new sources, but be very careful what you expose yourself to. Yeah, I think this is, this is very interesting, and you're both more, more qualified, I think, than I am to talk about the, uh, the Twitter and the internet. Um, I think that, you know, as, as modern Stoics and ancient Stoics, it's, it's a little bit harder for us to deal with the social issues. I mean, the ancient Stoics that, we, that survive don't really talk about general social issues. A little, I mean, Seneca talks about slavery uh, in a very humane way for his period. Um, they don't talk about political situations, perhaps because yeah, people had to be a little bit guarded, uh, and, and even in that time. Um, so, I mean, the great success of Stoicism, I think, has modern Stoicism has been its capacity to touch individuals uh, at, you know, at their core and, and address them. So addressing a, a, a larger audience, and it, I mean, uh, you know, to someone like Ryan Holiday going on Twitter, I mean, he does a very good job, I think, with his Daily Stoic. And it's been going now for, I mean, what I'm, several years. I, and I don't often look at it, but when I do, I'm, I'm always impressed. And he has a lot of followers. So that it, it's possible to, to touch a, a fairly large audience with stoicism. Um, but the internet, I, I honestly haven't really got um, a, a, anything useful, I, I think, thing to say about that. I mean, um, I think Ben, you started off by we were in a sense when asking whether you know governments should try to control the, the the internet. Was that part of your question? Well, no, but that that could. Um, I mean, that 
that could be part of the solution if, if in a in a in a world where such governments can do such things. Yeah, it's not going to work in the United States, I think, with our fixation on uh, you know liberty and uh, First Amendment. It's very good. So I think we just have to let people say stupid things. <laughs> But I don't think we should let them say stupid things when they are, you know, and picking up McDonald's when other people's lives are at stake. About I mean, vaccination and other is things, and people are just saying, you know, things that are so bad. Or they're not just bad and stupid; they're they're positively dangerous. Uh, I should I think there uh, I would I would like to see some attempt, you know. Yeah, but you get, you get into problems like states' rights versus federal rights. So it's, it's very complicated in this country. I, I mean, you know, there was a time when, and Donald may remember this, it was a terrible shooting episode in, uh, in Scotland, uh, probably 30 years ago now. Uh, I mean, it was a school, the kind of thing we've got too horribly used to here. And I think so overnight, there was a, a national revulsion and there, there were laws brought in. Do you remember the details, Donald, about that? Uh, sorry, I think, Tony, that's Dunblane. Yes, if I, I think remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, but I mean, there was a there was an instant reaction, and I mean, there was nobody was going around saying, "Well, this uh, you know we can't do anything because of gun rights." We don't have those those rights in that sense. So I think you know, it, change can happen, but how it happens is uh, is a, is the huge question. You know, how it can happen. Well, what, uh, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say I, I add something to that, which is that what British people love to tell their American friends is that from what I recall, that's the only school shooting in British history. Mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, the, the gun restrictions that were introduced basically brought an end yeah. to school shootings in the, in the UK, yeah. um, which is something that I think whatever um, you know, Americans make of that, I think they should, when, when they're discussing uh, gun legislation in, in the States, for example, people should at least look at the example of the Dunblane and the, the impact uh, that it had and, and gun regulation in the UK, but it's actually seldom discussed. Um, so at the very least, I think that should probably be brought up a little bit more. Well, if, if, if our chat about um, vaccinations wasn't igniting the, the chat box enough, then gun rights is going to send it <laughs> over the edge. I think. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're already pushing at our limits, so I think I'm going to have to take a few of the Q and A's if that's if that's all right. We we barely we barely really got started, and it was so fascinating um, listening to you all. Um, so we have a question, a very practical question. Maybe you can all three give a short answer. Is um, if you had to read one book, or you could even say one passage of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Where would you go if you just want to if, if you if you just want to dip in on, on the commute? Uh, I would pick the passage about uh, when you wake up, uh, remind yourself that today you're going to meet, and then he gives a long list of people who are uh, who are not grateful, who are who are uh, who are awkward, who are incompetent, and so on. It seems like terribly negative advice, but you know what? If during the day you get some some reasonably good encounters, it just makes your day because you're expecting the worst. Yeah, I mean that's a very good one to pick. I think Bill. I mean Epictetus sort of talks the same way in the Enchiridion. You know, he says. Um, when, when you go to the bathhouse, you know, remember that somebody is likely to steal your towel, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, um, and, and, and similarly, you know, when, he, you know, when your brother gets angry with you, you may well say to yourself, that's his problem. And it's not my problem to, to help his anger. My problem yeah. is how, how I respond to his anger. And, and so again, it was something we've touched on a lot that, that we do have this capacity to step back and control. And it, don't solve all our problems, but it's something which I think is is really touching a nerve with our with our modern uh, stoic followers. Yeah. Well, my favourite passage from the Meditations, and I have many, is the one where he says, "A mind free from uh, unhealthy or violent passions is like an impregnable citadel." And the reason I like that is it's obviously about psychological resilience building in a sense, which is on the subjects I'm interested in. But also I always wondered what the word for citadel was that he used in Greek. And then I realized uh, one day when I got a chance to look that it was Acropolis, 
and I, I, I live in Athens. Um, the Acropolis is just over there. <laughs> so I, I, I love the idea that he's alluding to an Acropolis, probably the Athenian Acropolis that he has in mind, and the view from above, the literally the, I mentioned earlier, the view that you have from the Acropolis is of the ancient Agora, where incidentally Socrates was tried and executed, and all the drama happens. So I think Marcus has in mind this a view that every tourist that comes to Athens is actually quite familiar with. Ben, can I have another quickie about Marcus Aurelius? I think my favourite is, as an emperor, you know, with enormous power, he says, don't ho hope for Plato's Republic, for a utopia. If you can make a little progress, you know, you've done, you've done a great deal. I mean, it's, it's this idea of being, you know, accepting reality at the same time, not, no, not despairing. Well, that, I think that quote really ties in very well to uh, the next question we have, which is, um, which again, I think comes from a lively chat going on in the chat box is stoicism is about control over oneself or, or one's response. But what about issues of public health or community well-being? It's um, quite clear from the chat people have, uh, people want to control the actions of others and they're alluding to masks and vaccines, et cetera. So, so, so how do we sort of square that circle of, I, I will do my bit when there is a, an issue which is not just about me, it's it. Uh, so, uh, uh, Stoic believes in uh, social duty and it's an interesting thing. It's a clear concept. And if you look at the way they, they lived their lives, they, they did feel they had a social duty. Um, from what I've been able to read though, they didn't go into much detail to explain what exactly that duty involved. So uh, one thing you, you do as a Stoic is you, you try to influence uh, events and you try to influence people's um, opinions you try to encourage, as I'm trying to do, people to go into life uh, with a critical but open mind. Uh, and uh, teaching, think about, think about um, what the Stoics did. They, uh, they, they would have had their schools, they would have in, encountered people on a one-to-one -one basis, and would have tried to change the world they see the way they saw their role in the world. And so that's what modern Stoics can do as well. Can I just add a little bit of historical trivia about this? Marcus Aurelius, according to the historian Herodian, practiced social distancing um, because Herodian, if I remember rightly, tells us that Marcus told his family and courtiers uh, not to remain in his presence because he didn't want to expose them um, to the possibility of contracting uh, the virus, which we believe was a strain of smallpox. He also used state funds to play, pay for the funerals of the poor because the bodies were piling up in uh, Rome uh, by the cartload, we're told. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he used public funds to try and improve the conditions of people during the pandemic. But the, the Romans didn't have, weren't really super hot on public health policy for the simple reason that they um, mainly believed that the plague was caused by the god Apollo punishing them. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of they sacrificed a lot of bulls um so th their conception of what was going on really clouded their their public health policy you might say um but nevertheless we can see that they're making efforts uh, at a state level to try and uh, improve the conditions of people that are exposed to the the virus and to, to prevent the spread of it um they um they believed that the virus was communicated through the air, um, but they thought the best way to deal with it was purifying the air by burning incense, which basically does nothing. Um, so unfortunately, they put a lot of effort into doing something that was ineffective. Um, so that, for that reason, it's kind of hard to make a comparison. But I think what the real problem that we're seeing in society today, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society for Public Health, and psychotherapists do a, a job that, that basically involves evidence-based public health promotion. And in a sense, that's kind of integral to all psychotherapy, because you have to take research uh, that's quite technical and then communicate it to random uh, individuals, members of the public, like 14-year-old kids that are socially excluded from school or you know, whatever. Um, and really what we've seen is an absolutely, I don't want to say catastrophic, but a, a 
a very surprising and very extreme breakdown of public health communication. And it's partly got to do with politicians jumping on the political bandwagon and turning the pandemic into a political football. And it's also got to do with the internet, allowing social media influencers and lobby groups um, to drown out the advice of epidemiologists and experts in the field like never before, um, in a sense. So, I, I mean, I feel like stoicism should have something to say about how we deal with this deluge of misinformation. And there's definitely a lot that we have to learn from this, because what we've just seen happening is someone who's kind of got an investment in public health, it's a complete and utter breakdown that we've seen of, of public health communication. So we really, as a society, we need to be thinking about how we can prevent that happening again in the future. Uh, and I hope stoicism can help with that. As a psychotherapist, I feel the other, Marcus Aurelius said, terrible as the pandemic is, there's a worse pa pandemic, which is the corruption of men's souls. And I, I thought that was a slightly callous thing to say. And now I'm starting to sympathize with him more and more. Because as I think we acknowledged earlier, pandemics in a sense aren't just caused by viruses. Pandemics are caused by people. Yeah. By, pandemics are caused by human behavior. Um, you know, people spread viruses. And, you know, really, um, I, part of what's driven this is uh, emotional reasoning um, and anger, uh, which is fueled in part by the internet is I think one of the things that's affected people's behavior and judgment during the, the pandemic. It's become a political issue, which really it shouldn't be, you know, it should be a, a, a medical issue, a scientific issue, um, not a matter of uh, that's divided down party political right. lines. So it's become a, a form of, of tribalism. And I think that has to do with the way that anger is biasing uh, people's judgments. And I think the Stoics would have a lot to say about that. Okay, well, we're, we're pretty much pushing our, our time limit. I'm very mindful of your time, especially Donald, who is creeping up on 2 a.m. Uh, there was a question um, about Commodus. Whoever wrote that, I would encourage you to, to re-watch this video when it comes out, because Donald actually addressed that quite uh, very thoroughly in his, um, his talk earlier today. So there's been a couple of little questions um, touching on Afghanistan, which is not the jolliest note to end on. But um, there was a question we didn't get round to, which, which links into that, I think, which is, um, should it be acceptable or advisable to tell a recently colonized, oppressed or molested people to just be more stoical? Is, is that, is that uh, a... Uh, is, would that be a very helpful thing to do, even if it seems slightly even distasteful to do in, in, in the immediate aftermath of a, of a terrible hap, a terrible event in someone's life? I, I just, I think the a question, of all respect to the question, I think the question invites a kind of old fashioned view of stoical. You certainly yeah. wouldn't say to somebody, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who just knew stoicism in the way I think that Bill described it before as a rather grim, you know, uh, keep keep things in, I, I, you know, I don't avoid, you know, avoid all emotion. Um, no, you wouldn't do that. Uh, of course you wouldn't. You would try to comfort them, of course. There's this wonderful passage where uh, Epictetus says, you know, it, uh, yes, you know, if something happens to your friend, you, you don't, um, you, you do everything you can to comfort that person. You don't, you may not groan inwardly, but you do everything you can. So I think kindness and, uh, and, and trying to help people in, in the ways that we've talked about in, 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 in the show, and perhaps not emphasizing so much the notion of trying to control, but the kind of the consolation. I mean, Seneca has wonderful essays on, on how to console people. And uh, so I think there's a huge amount of stoicism can do to bring comfort to people and, uh, and perhaps some understanding. I mean, understanding of because stoics are realists. I mean, they, they know that things happen for reasons. They may be very lamentable to be bad reasons, but they do happen for reasons. And so you, you, you don't help people by glossing things over, but you, but you don't tell them, you know, you, you would just try to say, you know, well, there's a lot of blame to go around here. Um, and now we have to move forward. And I think I almost might sound like Joe Biden, but I think there's, you know, that's, that's perhaps, stoicism can be very helpful, but not, don't tell people to be stoics because they will say that's not the way to be.
Yeah, here, here, I agree with that. Uh, but uh, here's uh, another stoic uh, take on this. You don't wait until the person realizes they need some tool to get through life to say, well, you know, here's, here's what you do, just be stoical. What you do is you say to everybody on the planet long before they need uh, the tool, you say, hey, everybody, there's a tool out there. It's easy to use, it's easy to learn. Uh, some people will take to it more naturally than other people will, but you want everybody ready in case their time in life comes when it's for them the emotional equivalent of what the people in Afghanistan are now uh, experiencing. And we three panelists are in the business of trying to make everyone aware, hey, now, do it now. There is this wonderful tool out there, a psychological tool. Learn how to use it because you never know what curves life's going to throw at you. A final word on that, um, Donald Robertson. And then I think, um, I think we'll, I think we have I, to. I think I agree with what uh, Bill and Tony have both said. I think uh, Tony mentioned really the most relevant passage. There are other passages in, in, in the Stoics, so uh, several in Marcus Aurelius, where he acknowledges this idea. But there's something actually I'd add to it. The, the passage that Bill mentioned earlier, which is book two, uh, chapter, uh, passage one uh, in the, the Meditations, perhaps the most widely quoted passage from the Meditations, where Marcus says, every morning when you wake up, tell yourself you're going to meet a whole string of Muppets. You're going to meet uh, belligerent people. You're going to meet anti-vaxxers. You're going to meet, you know, whatever, like uh, PC police. You're going to meet whoever, all those people that people complain about, you know, uh, petty people, uh, treasonous people, he says, and so on. Now, the, the kind of guy who says to people, suck it up, you guys, you should all just be more stoic and stop crying in your beer about stuff like that. That guy, I think Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and the rest would say, that he's a fool and that uh, the attitude that he's exhibiting is actually fundamentally counter stoic because of that passage and others. The stoics are realists and they believe that everybody is irrational and foolish, all of us. There are no perfect sages in the world and therefore it would be self-deceptive and foolish to treat other people as if we expected them to be perfect sages. That would be a lie. And I think that the Stoics think the wise man wakes up in the morning and sets out expecting that he's going to meet people that are angry, irrational, and foolish. And also that he has these flaws and weaknesses himself. And to say to people, just suck it up and you know, don't be upset about things, be more stoic about it. I think the Stoics would think that attitude is a height, the height of folly. Right. And uh, it's a very unrealistic and very foolish attitude to adopt. The wise man is, is more forgiving because he recognizes the universality of, of, of human feelings. Well, fantastic. We've got, um, I might have given uh, the three of you a, a false idea about what's going on in the chat box. We also have lots of uh, applauses and people saying thank you and wonderful wisdom and and um, lots of ind individual messages for you all as well, thanking you for your time and your wisdom on this topic. So I'd like to say um, very many thanks again to, to Donald Robertson, to Anthony Long and to William Irvin for making this very interesting, very engaging panel discussion. And um, I will say um, goodbye to everybody from me. And I think Anya is going to come in with a little bit of um, final words before we all go. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And thank you so much to our final panelists of this uh, weekend. Uh, it was absolute um, thought provoking and insightful uh, last hour I've had just watching and enjoying. And, um, you know, it, it is really fascinating because for us who live in the world of ancient history and classics and philosophy, kind of translating the knowledge of the ancient world to our modern world sometimes seems to be uh, a bit of a obstacle that we have to overcome. And it's, this is the first time we've done a conference on Zoom, for instance. In the past, we've done GoToWebinar, which is a very different program. And so this is the first time we've had this sort of live chat. Uh, and it's been really fascinating to sort of see a sort of multi-level experience of people sort of real-time 
putting out their ideas, sometimes good, sometimes bad, uh, always interesting. Um, and, and I hope that it's been a, an interesting experience for people to sort of interact with this sort of ancient knowledge, ancient wisdom, philosophy, history, and apply it to the modern world in a real time way. Like we have a lot of things going on in the world right now. We have a lot of polarization. We have a lot of issues going uh, internationally. I mean, empires and states are falling right now. Uh, this is very tragically applicable. Um, and it's important to take the ancient world into consideration. So I think it's, it's really wonderful that um, we can have this conversation, we can have civil discourse, and we can bring these important discussions into the modern era uh, and, and really make them accessible to everybody. So with that, I want to say thank you so much uh, to our final panelists. Also, thank you to everybody, all of our presenters over the last two days. We have just been absolutely blown away by the quality of speakers we've had. It's just been fantastic. I couldn't have dreamed in a lifetime to have so many brilliant minds uh, sharing one platform. It's been fantastic. To our wonderful moderators, thank you as well for taking the time and, and really being active and, and enjoying the conversation. To our fantastic audience who have been involved the entire time as well. And also a big shout out to our technician, um, Chris, who has been a magic making sure everything runs smoothly. We, we often uh, interact all the time and we see the people in the front of the stage. We don't appreciate the people behind stage. So I wanna say thank you as well to Chris. So uh, with that, everybody, I will be sending out recordings to all this event uh, in the next few days. We're gonna edit them simply because it's one long video. We're gonna make it more accessible for you all to be able to listen to. Um, but with that, I hope you've had a really great weekend. Uh, you've enjoyed the wine, you've enjoyed the conversation, you've enjoyed the wit and the wisdom, the thought provoking, even the, the, the fights on the chat. I mean, it's, it's, it's been an interesting weekend. So um, it's two in the morning here in Greece. And so with that, I will say good night to you all. And thank you again. <laughs>